For me, this is a very unique opportunity. Um, like Joanne had mentioned, when we had discussed talking or what this artist talk would, would be like in conjunction with the show, I really wanted to do something that was specific to my foundations and trajectory um, of creating the work that I've made, and also to my upbringing and to where creating work in public spaces on walls has led me, but also what it means to me. Um, I have, I've grown up here in New Mexico most of my life, um, also on, on the Navajo Nation. Um, and I started making work as a graffiti artist, um, which is also how I met Ket. Um, Ket is a longtime friend. Um, I've also admired his work for many, many years, um, even before we ever met, and was an inspiration to me as a young artist, as a young graffiti artist. He is taken this movement and the recognition of this movement to great lengths and is the co-founder of, of the first Museum of Graffiti, which is in Wynwood, and is also a historian, an archivist, a practicing artist, a curator. What else? Troublemaker. Father. <laughs> Father. <laughs> Uh, devil's advocate, <laughs> all the things. So thank you everyone here for, for being here. And um, this is a very special, special talk, I, I feel like, and uh, really rooted in the foundation. So thank you for, for being here for this. Talk I haven't done before. Well, and thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. I haven't been in Santa Fe for a while, and it's been some time since Nani, Nani and I have gone to hang out. And so this is a treat for me as much as, th as it is, I think, for you. Um, and so let's get into it, Nani. Yep. And so in, in our conversations, Nani, you know, we, we walk through the exhibition, which is an amazing, it's so amazing, of an exhibition. It's an inside joke. <laughs> Everybody always says it's amazing. You know, well, everything is amazing. Uh, but it is actually amazing and, and fabulous and, and really a, a joy to witness uh, Nani's transformation. Uh, over the past few decades and seeing the show here really, to me, brings me a lot of j personal joy. So I really hope you get to see it. But Nani, you weren't always exhibiting in fancy museums. I think quite the contrary. You're more, uh, the way that I know you, is more working outside uh, and, and more in sort of this sort of mischievous way. What are your, how did how, you get into being such a, mischievous young person? Yeah, um, I started, so I, I grew up here. Um, I grew up here in, in New Mexico, and before um, this time of me being an artist, um, I didn't really do anything that was art related. I didn't I wasn't a, like a talented drawer, I didn't do anything. I grew up on the west side of Albuquerque in a place called Corrales. It's pretty like, there's a mesa, there's a lot of farmland. Um, aside from that is me growing up on the res uh, out in Chinle, Arizona. Also another sprawling, large landscape. And I think mostly I, I was like a, an explorer. You know, I, I would kind of go around and check things out and catch lizards. And, you know, I really had this idyllic childhood. I got to be in, in landscapes. I got to see beautiful desert landscapes. Um, and both of those places lended to that. And when I was 15, I really got immersed in subcultures. I got really into music. I got really into punk rock. Uh, got really into hip hop, started trying to find my community who was also a part of, into listening to those music genres, um, and found like the skateboarding community as, and this is, this is in when I was, you know, about 12, 
12 or so, 12, 13. And um, part of that, part of the skateboarding culture here, which I think is, is really interesting, is we would go down, or at least through, through this group of friends that I had, they would go down to the Arroyos. So those of you who are from New Mexico totally know what an Arroyo, an arroyo is. Um, those of you who are not, um, and specifically in Albuquerque, is they are the drainage diversions that happen from the west side all the way up from the east side to the mountains, and it diverts all of the water, all of the rainfall shed into the river. And so it's these long stretches of concrete canals that, that go all over the city. And my friends would go down there to skate them. And they would, they would go down there and, and just, you know, they, they were huge playgrounds, really. It was concrete playgrounds. You're not supposed to do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there is like big campaigns, like the ditch witch, and you know, like you'll die. And sometimes you saw people die. You know, sometimes you saw people get swept away. So not condoning this in any shape or form. Um, I'll condone it. It's my PSA. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I, I would go down there with my friends and check this out. And this is what they look like. Um, this, these photos actually are from about, about the time that I was actually down there. And um, we would... You know, to me it was, I wasn't even thinking, I mean, the rebellious side started by going down there anyway. Like, that was the rebellious side. The rebellious side started with music. Um, a friend and mine were laughing because at the time in the early 90s, remember there was the campaigns, the like conservative uh, Bush campaigns of parental advisory, explicit lyrics, you know, like you couldn't, you'd get in trouble for wearing like a Motley Crue t-shirt with a pentagram on it or something, you know, you get sent home. And so like, that was already a rebellion. Tipper Gore. Yeah, Tipper Gore, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Can't forget Tipper Gore. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the rebellious started, started with that. And when I went down there and started seeing these, um, to me, that spark was really the juxtaposition of just seeing something I had never seen before and something that was continually changing. These, these felt alive. Um, looking at art, that was just continue. Every time we went down there, it was like something different, something new to see. Um, and it, I, it was familiar in the sense that I was seeing it in hip hop culture. I was seeing it in urban cultures. I was seeing it in the backdrop of like, you know, Blondie videos and, you know, all of these, like, in New York or videos that I'd see, and, and it was just, like, so appealing and so, like, something that wasn't a part of my landscape that I, that I had seen, and yet I, discover, I felt like I discovered it, you know, like I, like I was privy to something, you know, something different. And um, I just wanted, I wanted to learn it. I wanted to do it. Um, and I just... I didn't think about. I didn't think about it being illegal. I didn't think about it being um, something I wasn't supposed to do. I just thought that it was something I wanted to do. What did What did your parents think about that? Yeah, I mean that that was the other side of it. Is um, you know my my parents didn't like it. I didn't tell them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start there. I didn't tell him. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell him. And I, I think that needs to exist. Um, Kent and I have talked a lot about this movement being very significant because it is an art movement that has started, been started by children. Um, and it has this global, global capacity. And there is, there is a very strong element of, I think, kids maybe holding something sacred, you know, being able to hold and have a place where they, they make art aside from what their parents it's do their or own, think. Right? It's their own, right? It's something that's our own. It's something that is, I, I'm always fascinated by knowing that this started off with children and, and teenagers, and it's maybe the only art form that's done that. It's survived 50 years, and so for those of you that don't know, I mean, the, the impulse to write on a wall is, 
it's very old. Everybody does it. You know, um, it's you know, if you go into the catacombs, you'll see writings going back 200 years, um, and it's just something that humans do. Yet we get in trouble for it, which is pretty odd. And so, to me, the the art form that we're talking about, that we sort of have this shared bond, shared bond over, uh, is one that is in urban cities, uh, started by teenagers that are precocious and mischievous and bored uh, and want to get away from what their parents are into. And, and there's a lot of discovery and exploration and freedom in going out and discovering places like this, which looks like a really cool place. I'd like to go there and paint myself. <laughs> uh, but we find these places that are safe for us. It's sort of, they, it might be dangerous for adults, but they're safe for us because we're the only ones that are there, and we're not going to get in trouble because adults don't want to go in there. And so that's one of the, the magical things about uh, being uh, a teenager or, or a kid that discovers this movement is you find these safe havens where it's okay to be rebellious and, and mischievous and explore, or, or a terrible artist, you know, or a beginner. Uh, it's okay. You know, you get a, it's a practice place. It's a playground. And we sort of seek these places out as sort of the safe haven for exploration of ourselves and of our own identity and, and, and paint making. And I think it's very important to have those places. You know? and, and kids, no matter how many adults show up that are really conservative or square uh, and, and try to remove these places or paint them over a million times, teenagers will find another place. You know, it might be an abandoned warehouse. It might be, you know, the, the, tra the side of the train tracks. Places that adults don't like to go is where teenagers like to, to practice this the most, or where we like to practice the most, because now we're sort of forever teen. Some of us are forever teenagers <laughs> and keep at it. And, and so I love, I love that you discovered that and, and felt this sort of connection to it, because not everybody wants to disobey their parents, and not, <laughs> not everybody wants to... You know, as kids, like the goody two-shoes don't, don't want to do that. And so I, I like that you had this sort of uh, it, spirit. It was an, I mean, it was an impulse. I think it started with an impulse. Um, and then finding, and this is probably the appeal, I think, for a lot of writers, is then, then finding a community. Um, so I, tr I attribute a lot of the skill that I have had as an artist to to this practice first. Um, this practice, I mean, before then, as I had mentioned, I wasn't I wasn't formally trained. I wasn't, you know, a genius child prodigy, <laughs> painting figures and you know things like that. I, I wasn't I wasn't even interested in it. Like I wasn't even interested in it. It was this the recognition of space. Maybe this idea of, of being young, but being able to, to take something, to have something that was mine, to be able to like write my name on something, to like take back that space, um, and then to have that recognition in a community amongst my peers, and share that, share that celebration, share that shit talking, about other people, I don't know. Share those, share those little experiences with one another. Read a language, understand and, and have a, ling a shared language um, between each other. And for me, that was like very impactful. And, and it's something that adults don't really know about or didn't know about at the time, right? Or mo most didn't, and so it was your own. Yeah. It, was, it was for your generation. It was for your age group, so to speak. But that doesn't mean that there weren't rules and that there wasn't um, learning in it. And, and from what you know, you're showing now, you, you decided to go uh, and really do graffiti. Not the kind of graffiti that you just do for one summer <laughs> and then you know, stop. You, you got fully invested in it. What, what about this type of graffiti that we're seeing here sort of wild style graffiti or style writing where you're bending letters uh, and shaping them, trying to make the best um, fonts. What, what got you into this side of it? Yeah, I mean, there's something very appealing, I think, not, you know, not being under the pressure of having to draw a thing. 
you know, like not having to draw a flower and make it look like a flower because that was something I definitely didn't know how to do. Um, what I did learn how to do is how to write my name. We all, we all learn how to write our name. I knew how to do that, you know, from when I was five. And then, um, you know, I felt like graffiti started with this very, like, rudimentary principle within the line and understanding the line. And I'm, always, I'm obsessed with the line. I, the line is, to me, the line is poetry. It's still, it's still poetry. It doesn't, I always say to students, the line doesn't lie. You know, you can't, you can't lie a line. You know, it is what it is. You're going to see it. Um, and I, I started there. And I think, you know, at the time, um, you know, there's this, there's this kind of progression, I think, at the time of, of doing this because there wasn't a lot of out, like you were looking at it in space. You were looking at it in real time all the time. There wasn't the internet. There wasn't this opportunity to, I mean, out here in the Southwest, there wasn't even really magazines. It was so precious if you saw a graffiti magazine. Like I saw graffiti magazines that kept put out. <laughs> and it was like, oh my God, you know? <laughs> yeah, it was like, oh my God, this like traveled so far from New York. Um, we didn't see that kind of stuff. So you were seeing everything in real, la in real time. And um, I didn't understand how people got to this phase. So it started out with tagging, went into to making more developed letters. Um, and I think every side of it, I was just invested in, in trying to do more and more and more. Um, and all of this was happening in the space that, it was, that I was working in. Um, which is one of the beautiful things that I think a lot of people don't understand um, about the high levels that people work at um, as graffiti writers and definitely Kat has like, you know, gone, you know, and painted trains, painted subways in the dark, um, you know, that you're, you're thinking on all of these levels simultaneously in real time on a real surface. <clears throat> and so the challenge is happening so quick. And um, yeah, I think each challenge kind of brought on a new challenge. You, and writers do that. Um, I think the, the capacity for learning in that way is multiplied very quickly because also it's public. So you see, you see you're like everyone's going to see that. <laughs> All your mistakes. <laughs> All your mistakes. <laughs> All your mistakes. Tomorrow, you know. <laughs> and then, and then, and then uh, talk about it. And talk about it or celebrate it. Um, so, and then you have the other side of it, of, of the public. And that was always an interesting thing t for me, too, is because it made me very much aware of not just my, s my small community of writers or peers, but also that, like, the larger group of everybody else in the city was also paying attention. And, you know, at the time, I, I, for me, it's very interesting to have this conversation right now because graffiti has moved into a place of, of celebration. And I think it's moved into a place of acceptance. But at this moment in time, it wasn't necessarily an accepted action or an accepted art. It was <clears throat> something that people, uh, like you had said earlier, like people feared it. You know? Looked down upon it, dismissed it. I mean, you, you wouldn't ever tell anybody that you did this. It was, it was something that was really taboo, and you wouldn't share. You, you, you had to sort of have a double identity, right? You had to sort of hide it uh, and never really share it, you know, even from your family, you know, from, especially from your family. Uh, from your teachers, uh, they would rat you out. You maybe get arrested as a result, or in, or in some kind of trouble, or or maybe not allowed to leave your house. It'd lock you in, so you wouldn't go and, and paint. And so, it it is. It's come a long way in in many places. I think that um, as adults, we also forget that the kids that are out tagging right now, they're also not really loved. You know, as much as we celebrate. The, the, the masterfully done graffiti, the kids that are just starting out that are tagging, that's still seen as pretty taboo, even though 
some of us might appreciate it because we sort of understand the arc that these young people or these beginners might have. But most people, it's just, be, you know, many people see it as a nuisance. And so you went from maybe being a bit of a nuisance to then being, uh, you know, what you're seeing uh, up there on, on the screen is, uh, is a quite masterful rendition of lettering with the connections and the curls and the extensions. Um, and so for some, some people might be able to read it, some people might not be able to read it because it's its own language. You, you sort of found and discovered your own, your own style. And, uh, you know, I would imagine that that took you a very long time to master. Yeah, um, I devoted, all in all, um, about 10 years before I went into doing any other forms of art. Um, and I, I just focused on graffiti. And um, like I said, this is very like, sh like I think now it, you speak about like leading a double life. And that's something I feel like I've done my entire life. Like, at least not my entire life. There was the time before I did any of this <laughs> that I was just myself. But after then, it seems like there's always been a double life element. Um, and I think that even carries on going into the art world um, and choosing to do public artwork and then trying to find a space for that in institutions and galleries and museums. Trying to combine those worlds, trying to combine the world that's for the public trying to, to um, be inclusive and in, of environments of people in very secluded, and then also working within very secluded, maybe elitist um, spaces. And all the time kind of like working outside of the box. And like earlier, I'm going to allude to, we've, we have, we've been talking, um, of course, because like it's just wonderful to talk to, to Kat. Um, but you had said something earlier that was like, you know, tagging on the surface for kids is like the outlet that we have to think outside the box, to let, to like really bring our thinking for everybody. So not only for like, for like the child or the teenager, the whoever, even the adult that's doing it to get outside of their mindset and do something that's disruptive, but also for everybody else that encounters that. That it's like that one opportunity. It's like that glitch in the system, that glitch in, in our, in the status quo, you know, in the grid or wherever we want to see that, in, in the sidewalk um, that we get to experience. So those movements, um, I think, are very. Ha that's what has made it made them very very impactful. And um, we need re we need rebels. Society needs rebels. <laughs> Whether it's a, on a small level as a tag that's going to sort of jar you when you wake up in the morning because you didn't want it on your business. Or maybe it's not just that it's there, but what it says. Maybe it's a message. Maybe it's more than a name. And so I think that from my perspective and what I've seen, uh, we need that. We need, we need, society needs that, you know, to get pushed a little bit. Otherwise, we might just be a, um, a world of, uh, of accountants or something. <laughs> Something totally boring, you know, except that we need accountants too. But we don't need everybody to be an accountant, right? And so we want, we, we want and society needs to sort of break it. Otherwise, you know, who knows where we'll be. And so you, as this sort of rebellious person, and, and maybe not even so rebellious because you ended up adopting these norms of graffiti and, and you found this community and then you were accepted and received, you, I guess, maybe I would say, maybe rebelled out of that or moved just beyond that um, and started painting murals and, and, and not little tiny baby murals, but like gigantic I own the city murals. <laughs> how'd you, like why and, you know, how dare you? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh... I, I had tr transitioned out of, I mean, the, there, there is like a, ga a gap in the timeline. Um, it wasn't like I just went from, from, from graffiti into, um, and I'm going to skip ahead because I maybe put these a little bit out of order, but 
um, I didn't just go from doing graffiti and then painting a mural or portrait of somebody on a wall. Um, in that time, I, I had ended doing graffiti uh, around the time I got pregnant and had my son. I was just a very, very transitional moment, I think, for me as like a, a woman and just in my life. Um, of course, just also like not being able to like climb on top of a roof. <laughs> Seven months pregnant, whatever. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> be very hard. So jump a fence. Um, so I, I didn't do it. I just I just stopped completely. I didn't do anything. At the time, though, I was um, my my partner, my son's dad. Uh, was also a graffiti writer, was also a, um, a tattoo artist. He had been practicing tattoo art. Um, we had this very immersive community of artists. And it's interesting because we uh, have been talking about the layers of subcultures and how those subcultures kind of facilitated um, self, I want to say like self-learning or maybe peer learning. Um, I kind of don't like the, the idea of self taught, like the self-taught artist. I don't necessarily think I, I was self-taught because I don't know how you teach yourself, but you're, I was self-learned. Isn't it a bit of like um, this informal learning that's happening amongst friends and peers? And so maybe it's like informal mentorship, right? You're, you're just hanging around and you're soaking it up and, and you're exchanging ideas and maybe even exchanging drawings and, and work. And you kind of were in a very sort of, I, I personally, as an outsider, knowing the group of artists that you were in, you were kind of in a very special, magical place because everybody was so talented. Yeah, there there was a lot of um, just a, I, I think like in the tattoo world, there was a lot of artists that were constantly making work every day. Everybody that I knew who was making work, whether they're a graffiti artist, whether they're a tattoo artist, whether they were an illustrator. Um, you know, people, some people were making stuff for like kind of graphic design stuff. Everybody was doing something every day. Um, so I was in these very kind of like high momentum um, communities that, that people were, were very motivated. They were very interested, very into, you know, putting out new ideas, talking about ideas. Um, and it didn't feel different. That, that was the same thing that writers did. I mean, every, every day, we're, uh, like, graffiti writers, as, as part of, like, hanging out, you just sit there and you draw, you know, and you trade drawings, and you look at things, and then you go out and you make it. Um, and, you know, you make it together, and then you look at it again, and, you know, it's just, like, all of these things, like, critiquing uh, discipline, learning an ethic, all of these things were happening around me. And um, when I got pregnant, it was really just about transitioning that same ethic, that same work mode, um, that same obsession into just something else that I could do at home. And um, so I started trying to learn how to draw, and I started painting and trying to do figurative stuff. I got very much interested in um, illustration, like turn of the century illustration. Um, so like illustration from the 50s and like from the 30s. And that was like another really big source of inspiration. And I think I got really into it because I liked the fonts. I loved all of these like, to me they were like letter master you know, and I would just like, you know, find this beautiful sketch by like J.C. Lion Decker and it would just be these beautiful lines and curls and, you know, all of this stuff happening and it would have this beautiful kind of composition. And, and um, I was blown away. I was like, I couldn't figure it out. And so I started trying to mimic that and, and just the overall shape. And, and I think the thing that I didn't like or I didn't see was brown people, <laughs> brown people in that imagery. Um, it was like, if you looked, if you just took a, like a, you know, a snapshot of advertising 
from turn of the century to the 50s, it's like no brown people existed, except like in very romanticized situations. So I started making similar illustrations, but with brown people, with indigenous people, with Chicanas, with Chola looking, you know, women in, instead of, you know, whatever, Susie Homemaker. Um, <laughs> And aside from that, it's expanding my painting kind of capabilities. I also got into like following the trajectory of letters is started learning sign painting um, and took on a, an apprenticeship with a sign painter, Leopoldo Romero. And um, he started learning to also think about lettering in a more like super composed format um, and also how that works in the scheme of things of looking at a wall and presentation. And this photo here is me and Leopoldo working on one of the first murals that I created that was out here at, um, at uh, the Museum of Native Contemporary Art downtown, uh, the IAIA Museum. And um, yeah, we, this was all one shot. I had learned to use different kinds of paint. Um, started just kind of expanding out. And you, I would imagine it's all new tools. You had to really start to adapt to, to this new form of painting. Tools, but also like there was so much kind of beauty. And um, I think one thing that also like kind of carries over into graffiti is like, and is um, this idea of like being very clean, you know, like, like not like you don't do, drips and like very neat <laughs> yeah it's very refined be, and the the better you are at that the like more skill you have you know the the more the more you can make spray paint not look like spray paint is like an asset um and yeah being able to make very crisp clean decisions and i found a lot of overlap in these two practices also like understanding color um so much of the way that I learned was really all about being able to put something on a wall, how color worked on a wall. Um, nothing was different from learning about sign, signage. Um, you know, me, Leopoldo would, you know, wax poetic about color, sign color schemes, you know, and, and being able to read something from 100 feet away. Um, the yellows and the blacks, or the yellows and the reds. Yeah. The, the light blues. Yep, all of all of it. Um, and and it was interesting because I think later on, you know, in, in learning color theory, and hearing about color theory, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, I totally put an outline on, <laughs> put some highlights, <laughs> you know, make it make a pop, you know, do do things so that way it can really manipulate that that field of vision. And um, all of that was interesting. All of that played in, into the way that I learned to create art. So a lot, what you're saying is that you're, you know, you're going from graffiti into sign painting into mural, and you're, and you're really um, aware of the public witnessing and seeing your work. You want them to see it. You want it to be sort of visible, right? You learn all these tricks as a, as a graffiti artist and then as a sign painter. And so, you know, for me, when we were talking about your first mural, you see that in there. You see and that and more. Uh, and you see sort of a, an approach to painting a wall that has the sign painting, it has some sort of a grandiosity with the scale and, and the approach, but it's also a bit unconventional. Yeah, this, this is the first mural that I had ever created. Um, there was, I think, I think the biggest transition for myself coming out of graffiti and doing murals kind of with, with all of that, all of those things in mind um, was that there, were, there was a lot of freedom and resource to creating a mural. And it, it was a freedom and a resource that I had never encountered before. It wasn't like this commission thing from a store that I had to like very much abide to what they were doing. It wasn't like this graffiti thing where you're 
working at night, you're working under stress, under pressure, um, maybe illegally or legally, whatever. There was a lift involved that they were willing to give me and they were willing to pay me for it. And they were like, what space would you like? And I was just like, all of it. I want all of it. <laughs> this is what I've always wanted is all of it. Um, but really uh, started, you know, started kind of seeing the relationship between imagery and the spaces that they live. Um, the way that imagery can, can have a relationship with buildings. Um, and then the relationship with the people around them. And I started out first wanting to create something I had never seen before, something that I've always wanted to see, and that is the representation of indigenous people from and by indigenous people. Um, like I said, I'm looking at all of these magazines from like mid to early you know, century and only representations I saw were like highly romanticized ones, inaccurate ones, or ones that were in so far of a like archaic past that it wasn't anything I, I identified with. So what I did identify with within my own cultures is our philosophies, our teachings, um, and finding them highly relevant to, for today. So I wanted to create something that was all of that. And this piece, I think, for me, still becomes, I think it's, I think it's one, of, one, of my, one of my favorite pieces. Um, and it's the first one that I made because it was just like this like big exhale. You know, it was something, something I've always, always had wanted to, to make, even though I didn't know it. But when I made it, I was like, this feels good. This feels right. Um, and it brought together all of these tools that I had learned. Like this piece was created with spray paint, it was created with one shot, it was created with house paint. Some of it was brush painted, some of it was spray painted, some of it was, you know, um, put on there. And, and some of it was freestyled, some of it was gridded on there, some of it, I mean, it was just like all the things, all the things, all the tools came out. So many different, I mean, working between surfaces. Surfaces is such, such a big thing that I respect. Um, Graffiti are definitely working. You you don't have a choice. You know you're kind of you're kind of at at the mercy of whatever surface is there. There can be a standpipe or you know conduits in the way, and you figure it out. You don't have have the choice to say, you know, that's not going to work. It's got to work. Um, this kind of spans three different wall textures. Um, and yeah, so it, it was really, really interesting to start to create work this way. There was a lot of freedom in it. And at the same time, it really felt like, um, it felt like a, if, if, I could, if I could convey these, these large ideas, it wasn't as important to, to put myself in it, to put my, my name in it, you know, to put, put my, my tag in it. I don't sign any murals um, now at all. I, I never sign. I never sign murals. Sometimes people ask me to like write a little credit line, and they ask me to do that. But I don't. I don't feel the need to like put a signature. The signature is the piece itself. So you have this mural practice. You jump into it. Decide to take over Albuquerque. And New Mexico, big murals everywhere. Um, you, you know, you don't just sort of do it in the graffiti way, the kind of the way that I'm describing, just taking over space, which we love to do and not ask anybody for permission. You ask for permission, you engage the public, you, become, you develop a, a social practice, a community practice. Why? Yeah, I. I there seemed to feel this need um, to share this agency. Um, this whole time, I think the most important thing that graffiti, that painting in public spaces, that painting on walls, taking up space, was it, 
it empowered my agency as a young as a young woman. Um, even though you know, even though you're secret doing some of that, there is something very empowering about seeing yourself and knowing you did that, um, and seeing yourself in a space that doesn't recognize you in any other way. The you know, but knowing that you did that. And, and I felt the need that when I had this resource, I really, I really feel like painting murals for me a lot is just capitalizing on the, on the resource of being able to create this work. And also holding to the ethics that I'm, if I'm gonna create this work, um, that I really want it to be something that's shared. Um, that it can't just be me, I did that, I put my name on things, uh, I claimed that space back. Now it was like what I was more interested in was that conversation of working back and forth, being able to create something to learn something. Um, maybe it's not about peer learning now, it's about community learning. Um, being invited into spaces that I had never been in before and recognizing that the people who are there are gonna have to live with this work, gonna have to live, on, live with this this that's on the wall, but what what can it what can it bring? How can it be in conversation with the landscape? How can it be in conversation with the landscape, with the community, with the people, with the ideas, with the things that are happening in that time and space? Um, so I had shifted to a community practice and being inclusive of 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 this of the spaces that I was in. Um, to create something that also I would learn from and that I had never seen. And I think that there is, I, I have to recognize and I feel like there is a large part of creating work in public spaces, whether that's graffiti, mural, street art, whatever, that's revolutionary. And I, to me that's very interesting. I think that's very interesting to be able to do, because other than, than art, other than seeing that, like the only thing that we see in public spaces on, on the majority is advertising. Um, and that in itself is like, you know, we're not in control of that. That's meant for us to absorb, to consume, you know. Um, sorry, I, I should move this over and keep touching it. Um, so there is this revolutionary aspect, and I think that that's very interesting. And I, I would love to hear your thoughts and point of view on like the rev on what you feel is the most rev why street art, why murals are are such a revolutionary aspect right now, and how they continue to be. Sure, I mean I think that I mean you're you're hitting the the nail on the head. You're you know it's it's so critical to have this sort of counterbalance. In, in the world and visually, and, and that isn't just advertising. I mean, how much advertising can we consume? I don't even know how, how many times we've seen an ad a day anymore, thousands of times perhaps. It's now not just in, you know, out in the street, it's coming through your phone, if you're getting texted ads, it's like there is this, you know, AI, I'm scared of AI. AI is gonna, you know, selling you stuff before you even think that you sell, that you need to buy it. And so we live, we live in this hyper commercial, hyper consumer driven ex existence right now. It's pretty disgusting. It's, every, it's all about you know, buying and selling things. And so the most revolutionary thing in this is that we're, we're not selling anything. It's just art. It's just ideas. It's just beauty or you know, the this, this sharing and, and the people that do this could very well be creative directors at advertising companies selling more junk. They, they could be selling cars or whatever it is. You could be doing that. These <laughs> illustrations could be, you know, for Toyota up the block or whatever. And, and, but you chose a harder path. That's the big money path, by the way. And, you can and, change now if you want. Right. And, and if I did that path, um, I wouldn't have the opportunity to work with people. Um, if, if advertising, if like these systems probably were more inclusive of communities, of people with struggles, with what we're actually facing on the day to day with revolutionary um, aspects. Um, I do work with 
some groups, but they're, gra they're grassroots organizations, a lot of environmental groups, women's rights groups. Um, youth, I think youth have, we have a tremendous um, amount of knowledge to learn from young people because they have a freedom that, that we, we somehow like forgot about, you know? And I, I think that that's, that's incredibly beautiful and, and amazing and they just say things sometimes that are, that are so free um, that in time, you know, we forget about that because we're stressed out about bills or the status quo or, or whatever, whatever might exist. Um, I think the revolutionary thing about this direction that you're taking and so many artists that, that were, you know, I'm going to isolate it to the graffiti uh, art movement, is that they've seen themselves as outsiders. They see themselves, or we see ourselves as outsiders, they're sort of on the fringe. And, and we take some, some chances and have decided to sort of live sort of this counterculture lifestyle um, that's not normal for, for most people. Uh, whether it's to go and become a muralist or it's to become a tattoo artist or to uh, go and even just to be a painter. You know, you, most people don't want to be painters. There's it's no guarantee that you're going to have success to be a painter. It's actually a really hard road to take. And so seeing graffiti artists that are, or writers that have been normally, you know, on the fringes decide to come in uh, and, and sort of claim uh, their place is, to me, is a re very revolutionary and, and bold act. But I think that we've sort of realized that as we take over space as young people, that there's room for us to be bold, that there, there can be a room for us. And so some of, some of my favorite murals, um, yours and other uh, Muralists are ones that are former graffiti artists and that also have developed a social practice that have decided they've matured enough and they've worked enough in the street that they're not scared to go into communities or be a part of a community. I mean, that's a pretty bold thing to, to open yourself up, to change your work. Uh, and, I, and I love that. And, and I see it in, in your work and in other artists' work. And not everybody wants to do that. And so to me, that's a really sort of very specific part of, of your work that I think um, really makes you different than, than most of the graffiti writers that go into the world to do public work. And so it's, uh, it's and I'm sure it's quite challenging. Yeah, it's, it's not... Um, it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. <laughs> I mean, not everyone can do everything. Uh, for me, it's it's... It's interesting because, um, like I said, I, I, found, I found my voice. I found, I found my agency as a young person, as a woman, um, through, through these risks that I took. Um, and putting myself in these, these positions to learn. Um, and in that, I, I gained a lot. I gained community. I, I gained a way to exchange. I gained confidence. Um, I gained I gained so much stuff. And I think, for me, when I started moving into to creating murals and realizing that there was so much more out there that could be said that I can't say, um, I had already kind of done the, done the things that I wanted to say. Um, I had already, you know, wrote my name a thousand times. You know, I'd already asserted who I was in my environment. And it was more interesting for me to find ways to assert other people, other people's voice in that environment and to work with them. And at the same time, in tandem, um, learn something. Learn something that, that would, I mean, for me, a lot, a lot, there's a lot of process. There's a lot of process in creating community and engaged work, and it's very different. There's so many layers of, I think, wall art. I think in our conversations, we've agreed it's all necessary. It's all beautiful in some kind of capacity, shape, and form. Um, the place that I'm at now is, is sharing this, this process and this 
um, ability, this agency, with people who may not actually be like artistically inclined. And it, it, for me, I don't, I see, I still see the value in their work, their ideas, their presence being in a public space. Because when it's in a public space, it can create an exchange. Then you're creating that exchange, that idea it continues on and it lives. Walls live. Walls are alive. Like our communities, everything is alive. And it has a beginning, a middle, and it even has an end. And um, I think being able to share that span of um, its life with other people is, is very important to me. And it, it nourishes me to keep continuing on continuing on and making work. Are you, you've given yourself, it's, this is like, your, it's a service. You're a vehicle <laughs> in, in a way, you know. You're, 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 it's a lot. You're, you're, very, you're very much deciding to be a tool for whatever community that you're going into work. And I think that that's an amazing thing to, oh, it's so amazing. You're so amazing. <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's, such, it's such a cool thing to be able to do, to be able to give yourself in that way and, and to receive what you, you know, the benefit of that exposure or opening yourself up to whatever you're going to get from, from the people that you get to meet. On the, each wall becomes sort of a journey and, and its own experience that you know, as much as you're giving it or being part of this creation process, you're also getting, like you said, getting nurtured by the people that you get to collaborate and sometimes and who knows who you meet on these on these walls so I think it's it's a pretty it's a pretty radical idea uh, and but really rooted in in something very special and and I, I, you know loving you know it's you're doing it because you have a lot of love to, to sort of share and 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 also to receive so I think it's that's pretty radical in and of itself so what happens when these murals disappear. How do you feel that, you know, you said that there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. So what happens when they disappear? How do you feel about that? Yeah, um, I we, mean, this We talked is, about this a little bit, right? Like, in, in, here today, gone tomorrow, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, we, we, um, it was almost like that was a, a training in, in the, like a part of the training <laughs> from the beginning because uh, graffiti is highly ephemeral. It's highly ephemeral. Um, these, these photographs that I showed you at the beginning are like very precious and I didn't know that at the time. Um, and I thank, thank uh, Carlos and Joseph uh, for, for, for helping me put together some of those photographs because you're not, at the time, you weren't thinking of, um, you weren't thinking about documenting. You weren't thinking about, you know, putting these spaces. You thought about taking a photo of your piece because you knew that it could be, if you didn't do it then, it could be gone. It was going to be gone forever. And I've never been attached to the work once it's created. I think once it's created, it's living and it's there, and whoever encounters it is... Um, they were meant to see it. Um, just like I was maybe meant to see all of the things that I saw at the times that I saw them. Um, I hope these don't last. I hope buildings don't last. I hope cities don't last. I hope it all crumbles. I hope it's all destroyed. <laughs> I hope it goes back into the ground and it's, you know, vanished. This is punk uh, rock. This is punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, good night, everybody. Thank you. Uh, no. <laughs> um, yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I, don't, I don't have an attachment. For me, the, the, I think part of, part of the process, being able to, to create this work, is about the exchange. Having a genuine exchange and creating art out of it, creating, continuing on this language. Um, I'm highly attached. <laughs> I don't want it to crumble. I don't want it to end. Um, not, not at all. And I, 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 I'm very much um, inspired by musicians. I'm very much inspired by music. And I think you have to hear music 
at the time that it's played. You have to hear music live. You have to participate in going to shows and, and seeing, seeing the performance. Um, and that moment is, is cosmic in a way. It changes you. At the same time, creating this work, being at that moment, having those exchanges with people, with communities, um, creating an art out of it, that's the piece. Um, thereafter, each time each person sees that, gets to interact with it. Um, that's also maybe, maybe the performance. That's also, that's also the exchange that strangers get to see when they get to see something on a wall. Different, um, than, different than Instagram. Yes, don't look at any of this on Instagram. <laughs> um, yeah, which, uh, bringing it back to the show was a very beautiful component um, that I was happy that they included in this exhibition was, was a map, it was a map and a locator to find the actual, actual pieces to, to exchange, be a part of that. Part of, part of being present in art is just that, um, taking the time out to look at things in real life. And I think that that's something very precious. Um, you and get to experience the scale of it, the, 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 the majesty of, of the work. Yeah. I think it's so important to see in person. And I think we're running out of time, but I do want to ask you, Kat, um, because I really, I really just, I really feel so privileged to be, to be in this conversation with you and also um, where you are at with the Museum of Graffiti. And I, I want, I think now is an interesting time that we're all witnessing here. Um, and I think it's this recognition um, of this movement that we've talked about, this movement that was started by kids. Um, the progression and the trajectory of that, kind of breaking off into so many facets, going into so many areas of the world, um, and then being recognized into institutions and into museums. And I want to ask you, what do you, what is your hope um, for this recognition in, in having a museum, in having, having this global kind of movement um, that we're all that we're all captivated by. Sure. So, so for me, um, you know, we have a lot of things in common. I think what we don't have in common is I, I don't want to see it all crumble. <laughs> I want to I want to preserve it. I want to have photos of it. I want to have the videotape. I want to have the audio recording. I want to use it to, to to teach people about what I think is a very important art movement, uh, like you said, created by youth that that has been dismissed for so long. Uh, I opened the Museum of Graffiti uh, th about three years ago because no one else has done it, because I wanted to just do it. We're, we're kind of crazy like that. We'll just do it, you know, and, and, and um, I'm into it and just rolled up my sleeves and got to work. And so the, the work that I do and, and is preserving this art form and sort of the, the reason is that I think it's important and that I believe that all these artists need to be celebrated. They need to be known. They don't need to be unknown. And so the fact that you have an exhibition here in this museum is a big deal. It's not lost on me. I hope it's not lost on you or on any of you. And so normally artists that come from the streets don't make it into these places. They're not let in. They're, they're not noticed. And so she had to paint over 50, 100 murals. I don't know how many murals before anybody noticed to give her a solo show. And so I'm trying to speed that process up. I'm trying to celebrate people that haven't been noticed, that haven't been recognized. Many of them now that unfortunately our friends have passed away before they received the recognition. And so building a museum, I have 50 years of people to talk about. And it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, but I also want to talk about living artists. And so... My job that, that I've decided to take on is to speed up that conversation, speed up the recognition, speed up the acceptance, the com those, the, those conversations, so that artists that decide to be rebellious and come from the streets, quote unquote, also are part of a conversation while they're alive, so that they can maybe sell their work, so that they maybe can uh, have a, a a modest living or, or be a, a working artist. And so for me, um, it, it, that's, that's my sort of 
my, my goal, and that's the goal of the museum, is to sort of share the way that we have this conversation here today, share thousands of these conversations, and share the stories of these tens of thousands of artists around the world that are worth knowing and that are worth celebrating and that are worth um, just, you know, exhibiting. And so luckily, you know, we o I opened the museum and, and lo and behold, people come to the museum. We get visitors every day. And it's, it's a museum not as fancy as this museum maybe one day. But, you know, you come in and you read the plaques and you read the text on the wall and you see the pieces on the wall. And, and, and I'm a bit of a detective, so I'm always hunting for these pictures like the ones of the, uh, of the tags from the 90s here in Albuquerque and the ones from the 70s in New York and the Bronx. And we enlarge those images and find all the stuff and we have these conversations about all, all this stuff. The who, the what, the when, the where, the why, the innovators, the rule breakers, the troublemakers, the, the stylists. And, um, and yeah, I think it's important work to do. I wish someone else would do it because it's so much work. I hope that there's many other museums around the world that also take on the opportunity and the work to share uh, artists from this art form. And so the artists from this art form like you, you don't paint graffiti anymore. The work that you do that's in this exhibition, uh, it's wonderful and, and we celebrate it and we, we experience it. Uh, but you went in that way. And so the artists from our movement, sure, when they were very young, they did graffiti, but they've gone into so many different directions. There's, it's, it's amazing and so, so amazing. It's, uh, it's wonderful, to the st different styles. And so uh, we, we just sort of bring them all together and, and show that this sort of teenage art form when you go through it, just has an incredible trajectory and you just don't know where it is. And so I think we help a lot of people sort of understand that it's okay to doodle. It's okay to write on a wall. We actually even teach kids. We have kids drawing classes and parents actually bring their kids to learn how to do graffiti, which is wild. We're teaching five and six year olds how to do graffiti. I can't wait till they get some <laughs> spray cans in their hands. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I see my work and, and the value of having a museum for an ephemeral art form, which uh, to me, I, I like that it's ephemeral, but I also re re wish it wasn't ephemeral. I'd rather you not paint over it. Find another wall, you know, do something else with the city's resources other than cleaning off the graffiti. You know, maybe put it into education or, you know, something else. So, you know, I, I, you know and I change over time, you know, in my understanding as I deal with more people and more artists and, and more of the public. But, um, but yeah, Nani, thank you so much for the question and for, and everybody for, for being here today with us to, uh, to talk about yeah. all, all these I love things. that. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for bringing that. I feel that that's such an important piece to be said because we're really witnessing kind of this movement coming full circle um, and it coming, coming into the recognition that it deserves and there being spaces that kind of lend, lend to this discourse, lend to this recognition, lend to this preservation as something that, that taught me how to be an artist. Um, so yeah, thank you. And if you guys have any questions, um, we'll open up the floor to that. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if you could speak to um, the uh, what, what what seems to be to be distinctive about public art, right? Public publicly created art is how it incorporates all the various art forms, you know, uh, visual art, um, uh, uh, literary art, uh, performing art, right? I mean, when when it's being created, that's that's almost like a dance, right? And so I was just wondering if you could speak to the process, if there are subgenres of, of, of this art that are recognized universally or, yeah, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? It, it makes a little bit of sense to me. I think that, you know, when w the, so many artists that work in, in the public space are, there's so many personalities and so many sort of paths that artists have taken. And so the, the artists that like to paint murals have to have, it's almost a performance. You're out there every day. And so you have to be very patient. You're dealing with the public all the time. And so there's sort of that type of an artist. There's the artists that, that are more of the, um, that are still working in the public that, that, that are postering. They're creating work in the studio 
and they're postering and they're leaving the art behind everywhere and so they're less inclined to deal with the public and they don't want to necessarily have those conversations and so it's less of a performance it's more of a um, messaging you know um, and then there's artists that are just you know very invisible that that are just maybe speaking to a different group they're maybe not speaking to you maybe they're speaking to their peers and so th I think that there's depending on the city you have all these people coming together sometimes they're and, and they're and they're actually all working in the same space sometimes they're battling each other and they're, they're destroying each other's work because the space is limited and so to me I, I think it's fascinating because it's 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 changing every year it's different you know let's say in Miami right now where, where I currently live uh, you know ten years ago there was a lot of activity in the streets there were a lot of artists that were doing posters there were a lot of stencil artists uh, there were a lot of graffiti artists and there were muralists now there are no stencil artists they're, they're basically gone there are no poster artists they're basically gone the posters are now only advertising there were never advertising posters but the muralists are still there and the taggers and the graffiti artists are there so it, it changes from time to time and so I, I don't know if I'm quite answering your question yeah, you know, I'm just mainly, uh, I mean, main, the main thing maybe think the question is uh, well, the, the incorporation of poetry it's uh, it's out there too yeah, it, it's I see it too like so much of it is so much of it both visual poetry and you know uh, literary poetry there, characters that's poetic well there's also there's that but there's also actually people that are writing poems on walls I, I see I see that on walls I have photos of them I, it's always odd when I see a, a street poet right. in that way yeah. you know and so I, I find it fascinating that they want to sit there and write their poem um, but the streets are really great for communication they're really great for sharing ideas right I think about it's free right. and that's poetry in and of itself. yeah, yeah. Um, but so thank you for the question I have a couple questions. So, um, question for both of you. What did you write? Why did you pick that name? And were you ever a part of a crew? <laughs> um, yeah, so I wrote Cupid. Why I picked that name, I was telling the story to get. Um, it's kind of funny. Um, I'm, um, I'm a bit of an insomniac. I'm a bit of a late night worker, night owl. And I used to write a name called Blink. And I just picked that. I don't even know why I picked it. I just was like, this is good enough. <laughs> I don't know. I, I wasn't, I kind of wasn't attached to it. I, I did want something a little bit different. Um, it was also kind of an awkward, awkward thing once I actually started doing it um, to, to find a flow in it. And um, I was working, I was drawing late at night, and s the TV was on, and Star Trek was on. And um, there's a character in Star Trek called Q. He's like, I think he's that real pale guy. Um, this I'm not. Kind of, this is, this is kind of like <laughs> Star Trek music. Yeah, this, this is a good segue uh, into the story. And. Um, and yeah, the, the name of the, the episode was Cupid. And so I was just like, you know, loosely looking at this thing and doodling and um, it really big on the screen, it just flashed Cupid in capital letters. And I was like, whoa, that's cool, you know? And I liked it. I liked the way it looked. I liked the form of it. And I just, I thought it was cute. You know, it was, it was feminine and um, it, it was interesting to me. I never thought about that word being written like that. It, it looked very graffiti to me, just seeing it, you know, like uh, this different way of writing something. So I just, I started fooling around with that. Um, cues were difficult, kind of awkward too, but So you wrote it out. Cupid, Q-P-I-D. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it came from Star Trek. I'm not a Star Trek fan. <laughs> I may have been the only Star Trek episode that I've ever really like looked at. Um, and what was your other question? Crews. Crews, crews. Um, you know what? Crews are, are interesting. Um, I didn't paint with too many crews. It was, it was hard. I painted one of, one of my 
you know, old time partners and person I painted with a lot um, is here. Shug, um, my partner for a long time during that period, was also a graffiti writer. But it was um, my, my son's dad. But it was also very hard to not feel tokenized as a woman um, in kind of this like guys club. So I, in a weird way, I, I made a lot of choices to paint alone um, because I wanted to stand out for like my style and for the spaces that I was choosing to paint in. Um, I wanted to to find find that I, I wanted people to see that I I, I didn't know, I kind of didn't want to attribute it to to a mass you know even though that's a very important part of of the whole culture as a crew but I at the time it was it was really hard to um, really feel like like I was doing this for myself um, so I, I I was very selective through the entire time with, with the people that I chose to paint with. Um, it was a very big trust, trust thing for me. Um, and really, really finding, finding a few people that I, I, I really, I really vibed with, you know, it was, it was less about, about the crew and, and the whole, like, that's, a, that's a whole other conversation that, that can go all over the place. But, but actually, yeah, I was, I, I resisted that um, for a lot of reasons. So I didn't resist that. I'm, <laughs> I'm in a, I was in a lot of graffiti crews, but there were always crews that were friends um, for the most part. And so for me, in, you know, growing up in New York City, uh, crews meant protection. It meant you know, that you weren't attacked by like whoever, whatever other rival crew or maniacs in, in, in the streets. And so I grew up in New York in the 70s and the 80s. And the minute that you left your in Brooklyn, the minute you left your uh, my apartment, it was it was dangerous. And so, if you were a couple of guys together, it was much more it was much safer than one person. I was mugged many times and uh, shot at and and held up at knife point and gun point. And eventually, you know, all before 15. Uh, and so, eventually, I got tired of that and got you know involved in, in crews and started carrying my own weapons and became you know the, the predator so to speak and and so it's just kind of like part of growing up in in those dangerous times uh, and my graffiti name is Ket K-E-T so my name is Alan Ket it's not my real name it's my last name is my graffiti name now it's sort of the name that I've chosen to go by and it was just sort of a silly word that we came up in the school lunchroom in high school I was I was tired of writing different names that I'd go out the next day and see them on the wall and it's like every word was taken uh, and so I finally settled, settled on those three letters and of course three days later I saw it up on the wall and it was taken <laughs> and I decided I wasn't going to change it anymore and I've outlasted all the other versions of Ket. I've been Ket for 35 years or something like that and it's um, but it's, it's, just, it's just three words, three letters rather and that's basically it. In terms of, you know, your trajectory from a graffiti artist to a bona fide artist, I guess one could say, uh, is, uh, you know, the, the difference of you in the street tagging, the difference between, say, like claiming space and reclaiming space, mm. right? Like, I, I guess, it, can you say a little bit more about doing that kind of work as an an indigenous woman? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I feel like like claiming, like I, I had to learn to claim space. I had to feel confident in, in my agency um, and build up to that. And then I think I, I think at some point it was, it was, it was that like action reaction, right? Um, the initial like just to claim a space was me reacting, um, me reacting to what I saw, in a way maybe mimicking, in a way doing something that was just emotion, 
um, reclaiming space to me became an act of, of political defiance. It, it became a, an assertion of, of understanding who I was at that time, what my presence brings to the world, and understanding that it's always belonged to me. And then reclaiming that space and sharing in that reclamation as well. So, yeah. You talked about the walls uh, have you, uh, growing. And uh, going back to your, your first mural, how do you feel about graffiti artists adding on to that mural and eventually getting it buffed? Or just graffiti artists in general going over murals these days? Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, I hate it, but because part of that like hurts, you know, it never, it never not like, I don't know, there's a part I think I was even realizing it because um, Kat was asking me the same question. And like, there's that like party that just kind of like, starts to like get kind of like agitated and like, kind of like, you started to sweat. <laughs> <laughs> I started talking about like violence and like, you know, just being pissed off and, you know, there's part of that, right? But also, um, you know, that first mural that I did, um, and it's interesting that you bring that up, it, it was, it's no longer existing. It's totally like graffitied, like crazy. Um, and there was a decision, there was a, like, there was a moment when that piece itself started getting um, tagged and bombed and gone over that it was really like defining my purpose of creating it. Was I going to go into that momentum of like defiance, defending, having to defend my work, or do I... Or do I recognize that as, a, as an art form with a lifespan? Um, and that this piece was created um, for a purpose, and that purpose was completed. Um, if it lasted 100 years, if it lasted a week, it was the, the purpose was still fulfilled. And I think that's the way that I feel about creating murals. I'm less, I'm less attached to them emotionally and I think that took a progression of me um, you know coming coming from I've, I've got been gone over hundreds of times um, I, I mean every graffiti thing I, it's it's a miracle I feel like if anything is lasting especially because I haven't kept up with doing anything new um, and I think when things do last that long I think that's very special you know um, I, I think that that is a testament to the life of the community. You know, I think that, that that speaks to that exchange, that speaks to that life, that speaks to that respect, that speaks to that time and moment of what people see and want to keep seeing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the going over and the preservation just as much as the piece being, being there. I don't, I don't feel the necessity... That, some, that anything I create has to last forever. Um, which brings into another thing, at least anything that's in a landscape and that's, that's living out there. Um, I feel like making my work in museums um, does lend to that opportunity. This is the, the time and the space for preservation. This is the time. The, the pieces that I've chosen to create here, of course, are very different from the way that I create murals, and it's very different from the way that I, of course, didn't do anything outside. Um, these pieces are have a, have a different context. Any any other questions? Um, thank you so much for the talk, and it's been really exciting. I I don't really know much about the topic, so it's been really new. Um, in one of the murals, there was a part that had windows that looked like they had been painted yellow. And so I was just kind of wondering with that conversation about surfaces, um, it was the one with the woman and child on her back. Okay. And um, I was just wondering, like, how do windows factor in in terms of, like, part of the design and then, like, maybe being a remnant or maybe being, like, the sole surface? I, I love buildings. I love architecture. Um, 
I think I always have. I've always loved surfaces, and I mean, I, I learned to paint on weird surfaces. I learned to paint and incorporate, you know, pipes and, you know, doors and windows and breaks in that, and, you know, painting a freight train, you know, you're looking at, it, it, you know, it looks flat, but it's like, you know, it's like you have this depth that you have to compensate for and think about. And um, I look at this as part of the whole thing, you know? I, I, I like to look at, I like to look at the building and the space around it as being integral to the work. Um, I think the building itself has a life. The building itself has its own aesthetic and nostalgia and its own history that I don't necessarily feel like I, w I want to cover that up. I want it to be in co my work to be in conversation with it. I think it's more interesting that way. Um, and yeah, I mean, there, and some of those judgments, some of like a lot on this piece in particular that you're referring to. This piece, the building actually changed um, like about a week before I painted it. And um, yeah, so I kind of like retrofitted it. And then some of the judgments, let's see if I can just do this. Like, you know, I had sketched her out and I even loved the, the brick as skin tone. And um, so instead of, like, this wasn't, you know, anything I was, like, planning on doing, but it just worked, and I went with it as just incorporating, you know, doing, doing the outer limits, um, highlights, shadows, and contours of her skin, but not necessarily filling in the skin and letting it be the brick, um, because it worked out. Um, and, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's, there's improvisation in spaces. I like that side of it. Um, I think always working on a wall, you improvise. Every surface, every situation is different. Any other questions, anybody? No. Nope. Cool. All right, thank, thank you, you so guys. Much. Thank you, everyone.